Welcome to Utah State University's Vertebrate Paleontology course. My name is Benjamin Berger. In this lecture, we will go through the steps it takes for a vertebrate animal to become fossilized and how fossils are discovered in the field and described to fellow scientists and the public. The study of how fossils become preserved in the rock record is called taphonomy. All fossils are once dead animals, meaning that the first step to make a fossil is the animal has to die. The next step is for the remains to be buried quickly before the skeleton becomes disarticulated or the bones weather away. <laughs> Often burial happens uh, where sediment is transported and can quickly cover the remains. These include fluvial or river type deposits, lacustrian or lake deposits, eolian, these are sand dunes, or other depositional environments where sediment is transported. Fossils require burial by sediment that later becomes lithified into sedimentary rocks. Igneous and metamorphic rock do not preserve fossils. Once the bone is buried, organic minerals are leached out and are replaced by inorganic minerals. The principal minerals in fossilization are calcite and silica, or quartz. Now, calcite is in the form of calcium carbonate when it's dissolved in groundwater, and it passes through the remains of the animal. The organic matter, the fleshy, gooey bits, are broken down with heat and pressure and are slowly replaced by calcite in this bath of groundwater, which is rich in calcium carbonate, which is calcium and carbonate, which is dissolved in the water. Microbes feed on the remains as well and help to preserve the bones by the secretion of iron oxides like hematite. These iron oxides are often found encrusting on fossil bone. As the organic material is broken down, the bone is gradually replaced by calcium carbonate, which crystallizes as calcite. Sometimes bones are buried at high temperatures, in which case then silica is also dissolved in the really hot groundwaters, and this passes through the fossil and can replace a lot of those organic materials inside the the fossil. So this calcite and silica replaces the organic material in the bones, but the bones themselves still preserve the morphology or the shape of the original bone. Silica is a really hard mineral when it's cooled, so often it's actually harder than the surrounding rock. Fossils rich in calcite are sometimes weaker than the surrounding rock. Some fossils are made out of pyrite, which happens when groundwater is rich in sulfur, such as seawater. Many marine reptiles and other marine fossils are preserved with pyrite rather than calcium or silica. It's important to note that the original organic matter is often not left in a fossil. Sometimes enamel found in fish scales and teeth are the only original material preserved unaltered and fossilization rarely preserves organic compounds. These long chains of carbon molecules are broken down into smaller and smaller molecules, which are referred to as volatile organic compounds, and are released into the pore spaces of the rocks as either gases or liquids. In very rare instances, these polymers, often in the form of very resilient protein molecules can survive, such as the keratin in uh, nails and claws, or in the marrow cavity of some dinosaur bones. All right, here I have a piece of fossilized wood and a piece of unfossilized wood. And we can see that the unfossilized wood is much lighter 
than the fossilized much heavier <laughs> wood. And this is because the fossil wood has become lithified. It contains silica and cal calcite, mostly silica in this case, which has filled in the pore spaces, the open spaces within the original wood. Yet it still resembles the original wood in terms of its shape and morphology. So we can get an, an impression of what the wood originally looked like. This process of lithification is called diagenesis. Now, the final stage of the fossil is the most critical. It's got to make get all the way back up to the surface, be exposed, and someone has got to see it eroding out of the rock to be collected. Most fossils likely remain deeply buried underground or get so deeply buried that the rock itself melts and destroys the fossil. Paleontologists scour the surface of rocks looking for the emergence of fossils. This process is often long and arduous. Deserts where vegetation does not cover the rocks are great places to look for fossils. But fossils can be found anywhere there are sedimentary rocks. Check out my video here, which I recorded in 2013, collecting Eocene fossils in Utah in the Uinta Formation. It'll show you how we record fossil localities in the field, how to jacket a fossil, and the steps to get the fossil out of the ground. Or you can check out my recent 2016 trip to collect fossils in Wyoming in the Washakie Formation and how I live in the field, as well as some additional fossil discoveries from this rock unit. It's a lot of work, but with a trained eye, you can find fossils. Before you head out to collect fossils, be sure to obtain permission and any government permits required to collect fossils in the area you're looking. Excellent. You should now be able to construct a box model, a flow chart, like this one, illustrating how a vertebrate animal becomes fossilized from death of the individual to its discovery by a researcher. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the Utah State University Geology Program, check out the website geology.usu.edu or my own website at benjamin slash Links are found in the description below.